Community Church, and a special welcome to you if you're new or visiting, if you're here for the first time. Uh, I'm going to get you to stand up and say hi to your neighbor. Hi, neighbor. Hi, neighbor. How are you today? Good. Good. A little tired, but good. I'm going to stretch your voice today. All right, please uh, find your seats. We have a few announcements to go through. Uh, so take your seats. So this, uh, this Sunday, today, after the service, um, it's a special service because Scott Redenbach is going to be getting baptized. Um, yeah. So rather than having coffee outside, we're not going to have coffee because the goal is going to be to get going to his baptism right away. So we encourage everybody to leave fairly quickly so we can do it in a timely way. Um, the baptism is going to be off-site. I don't know exactly where, but more details are to come. Is there a slide? That's good. Okay, at Meadow Park. So head to Meadow Park right after the service today um, to watch Scott get baptized. Um, potluck is happening next Sunday after the service, and because uh, the weather is beautiful right now, we're going to do it outside, kind of by the grassy area there, and we're going to have a bit of a barbecue. So uh, in the email it said if your last name starts between A and F, bring a main dish, but if your last name starts between A and F, you are excused next week because we're going to have hot dogs and veggie dogs. Um, so the main course is taken care of. Everybody else uh, with other last names and what you're supposed to bring, please still bring like salads and desserts and sides. Um, but we will have hot dogs and veggie dogs as a main. Um, and bring a lawn chair, bring a blanket. Uh, we're going to hang out where the rumor has it there might even be some badminton or bocce ball and other such fun games. Um, so come prepared. Ping pong, yeah, lots of stuff. Um, also, next Sunday... Um, after the service, uh, there's going to be a, a ladies' huddle to talk about some of the ministries that um, Steph has spearheaded and how to continue those. Um, so that's like VBS, Thriving Moms, um, Children's Sunday School. Um, so please, uh, ladies, come and join and be part of this. And um, we want to figure out how to keep these things going and going strong. Um, so you're all welcome next Sunday after the service uh, to discuss that. Also, Ruth wants me to tell you that she has just started a Bible study on the book of Revelation, Tuesday evenings, 7 p.m. at her place. Um, is that it? That's it. Good. Perfect. Tuesday, 7 p.m. at her place. Um, Karen, I would like to invite you up to make an announcement. Hi there, and good morning. Um, I'll be, I promised that I'd be fast, so don't worry, this, I've got my notes, I'm just getting myself organized here. Uh, so we are doing a, another fundraiser, 
You can let him come up. Just let him go. <laughs> it's okay. Come. We're doing another fundraiser for the refugee sponsorship. Uh, we are sponsoring a refugee family. We've committed for a full year financially. Um, the next one, so there's four points I want to make today, okay? Save the date. Save the date. August 27th is a Saturday. Save the date, okay? Um, volunteer. That's the second one. Volunteer, please, members of our, our church and our community. Bring cash, okay? And then for those of you that are going to come, please walk, bike, or bus. There will be parking, but it's going to be limited we're praying for really beautiful weather. Walk, bike, or bus. Clinton Giovanni Danoni, he is April and David Gibson's son-in-law. He is a piano prodigy. By grade, oh, I think he's 10 years old, grade 10 piano. So he's a musical genius, and he is donating his time and his energy to come and perform for us here, August 27th. So tell your friends, tell your family, this is a Amazing, beautiful opportunity, beautiful music. There is a little QR code. Uh, it will link you to his website. So please check it out. I'm handing out posters. Uh, and we do actually have some posters. So I know I said I'd be quick. This is probably depends on how quickly people will volunteer for us, okay? I have posters that need to go up. And they need to go up in specific locations, those of you who live in town. Pemberton, we've already have volunteer for Pemberton. We have a few that need to go to the city, so I believe April has volunteered those ones. These ones are for you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Village. We need them to go up in the village. I'm calling on somebody to come up right now. 15, I've even got your thumbtacks. 15 that will go up in the village in various areas, library, OW, thank you, pray. Oh, Love you. <laughs> yes, Grace, thank you. Where's Mama? Where's Mama? Oh, okay. Is it Grace? Oh, good, okay, good, okay. I've got White Gold, Spruce Grove, Riverside, Scandinav posters. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> He's already running down the aisle. <laughs> it's already labeled. I suggest you take some, some tape as well. Take it. It's okay. They're going to give them away. I don't want them. Mama. 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 Brio Nordic. Mama. Who lives in Brio? <laughs> There's only 10. Mama. Shh. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to call up Pastor John and Paul to the front. And um, in the meantime, let me just pray over our service. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this glorious day that you've made. Thank you that we have uh, much to rejoice over and celebrate this day as a church body. Um, and uh, thank you that your mercies are new today, Lord. Uh, I pray that uh, you would help us to, to praise you as we ought to, Lord, and that you would be glorified today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Nico. Um, so Paul is up here because back in March, we asked you guys to provide some nominations 
for people to serve as deacons on our leadership team. And uh, so we've had a chance to review the nominations and do some vetting and kind of say, okay, who do we want to put forward to you guys next for you to vote? And so today we have a brother, one of the people in town who is entirely worthy of the title of local legend, Paul Jameson. And so I've invited him up here because I would like for him to, for you guys to hear his heart for serving the church, a bit of his story, so that you guys know who this is, and then the way this is going to work is uh, over a period of the next couple of weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to vote. Um, and so, Paul, why don't you just share a little bit of your story and how you would see yourself serving in the church? Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I'm not the best public speaker, but uh, Steph gave me some advice just to keep trying a little bit of it, and then I'll get better out of it. It's kind of like that theory, if you have an allergy, just take a little bit at a time, and hopefully it goes away. I don't know if that's real, but my fear is. Um, <laughs> so, uh, John had asked me to prepare for a few questions, and the first being, what is my testimony, and how did I come to uh, Worcester Community Church? Uh, so briefly, like a lot of people today, uh, I was taking a, look, a, a deep look at the world, and I discovered that the world seemed to be diametrically opposed to the Christian faith. Uh, whatever God had stated to be good, the world told me it was bad. And all that God had stated to be bad, the world told me that was good. Um, at that point, I decided I needed to investigate God a little bit deeper. And it wasn't long before uh, I bend my knee. Uh, once I opened my heart to him, he came flooding in. And I started looking for a church and discovered Worcester Community Church. Uh, I was welcomed with open arms. And I remember being so nervous and the MC then first, right off the bat, says, okay, everyone turn to your neighbor and say hi. Uh, so a moment of panic there. But I remember um, Sheena had come all the way across the church to say hello. Um, so I'll never forget that. I continued to in attend, met with John, Hakan, Calvin, Darcy, Steve, and others. I was baptized in the River of Golden Dreams by John, and many of you attended. Uh, and now here I stand today. Uh, so when and how did I decide to become part of church leadership? When I first came to church, I started to become an active member. I continued to feel increasingly part of the church. I remember thinking I could do more. Um, and when election time came around, I thought, could I possibly be a ch church leader? Uh, that didn't last too long as I figured I needed a, to learn a lot more about what it meant to be Christian and what it meant to be a leader in the church. But as time passed and I spent more time with others and I was encouraged more, uh, I started to feel God calling me to take a step in trust of him. The last years, we all know, have been difficult, uh, to say the least. And in about in the last five months, I've really felt God pushing me to do more. Uh, the opportunity arose, and with his strength, I moved forward. I entered into a leadership training period over the last three months, and I hope my efforts have glorified God. Uh, what am I looking to do as a church leader? Uh, simply put, I'm looking forward to serve this church by honoring God. I want to help where needed, I want to be responsible to this congregation, and I want the congregation, my friends and family, to keep me accountable. In this last three months, I've tried to do that as we move forward in a, into a somewhat unknown future. I pray, that, um, I pray that I continue to do that. I'm excited to see God change me more into who he has me, made me to be. I have made such a large change, or he's made such a large change in me in the last six or seven years, and I know there's more to come. I pray as we walk alongside together, uh, walk alongside each other, as iron sharpens iron, we can glorify God in all we do. And with that, I thank you. thinking about this next song that we're going to sing together. It's been a really important song in my life, in my faith life. Um, it encouraged me in the time uh, as God was working on me and, and calling me to faith. And uh, I actually sang it in a little, a little bar in Mexico one time. <laughs> and it was full of people who were looking for God, I think. So uh, won't you stand up and join me? You reign on high 
Every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. thought over every word may my life reflect the beauty of my lord because you mean more to me than any earthly thing so won't you reign in me again won't you reign in me again won't you reign to Damascus while on his way with orders and a passion to persecute Christians Saul and his companions were met by a blinding white light he was forever changed from hater to lover of Jesus he was overcome in a supernatural encounter with Jesus Saul changed to Paul and then later Later in Damascus, this is from Acts 9, verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we just invite you in today, God. We just ask you to preside over our service and to be lifted up and give us your encouragement today, God. We're, uh, we're excited to see a baptism today, and we're just excited to be together. We just ask you to fill up this room, to fill up this building, to be here on your property and your place. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free, my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord, there's nothing worth more that will ever come close, no thing can compare. You're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free, 
My shame is undone In your presence, Lord Let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder leaves us breathless in of wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. you've done for me brings our chaos back into order makes the orphan son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love.
that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Please uh, bow your heads and join me in prayer this morning. Uh, Lord God, it's to you that we pray today. You are our maker, you are our Lord, our advocate, and our savior. So may you increase and may we decrease. We are your people and your creation. Our existence comes from you and our every breath is owed to you. Thank you that you're a merciful high priest. You're with us every moment, and we can cast our anxieties on you, knowing that you care for us. You're sovereign over all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Your promises are sure, and we can count on you. Lord, we praise you today for Scott's baptism. Thank you for drawing him in, revealing yourself to him, and the work of salvation in his life. Bless him and prosper him as he follows you. Protect him from the harm of Satan. Thank you for David and April and for David's willingness to serve where is needed and be adaptable in our time of transition. Lord, we pray for our church as we try to discern where you've put opportunities for us to be your ambassadors foremost. God, give us wisdom, give us courage, and a heart for the lost in this town. Soften our hearts so that we would rise to your calling and be obedient. And would you bless the Pazook family in their move, and may John be a blessing to Northview Church, especially in equipping young pastors. God, we pray for pregnancy care centers who are particularly under attack right now. Psalm 139, 13 says, You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. So, Lord, please protect the lives of the unborn. Open the eyes of our leaders and lawmakers to know that life is precious in all stages and help us to be agents of truth with grace. We thank you for the opportunity to praise you in our church today with Christians visiting from all over. Thank you for the edification we receive from connecting with other followers. Help us today to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to call up uh, the Sunday school teacher and all the kids, come on up to the front. Don't be shy. Looks like a full house. This is good. Okay. So I know that next Sunday we are having a meeting um, to talk about the um, children's ministries um, that are happening. And uh, the comment was, um, if there's any ladies that are interested, want to have more information, but we're keen for men as well. So if there's any men out there who... Um, want to have as much fun as we do, then uh, please let uh, some of the leadership know. We are moving along in our study of the Old Testament, and the Israelite people are having a very hard time trusting God. So we're going this week from Samuel, the last of the judges, to Saul, the first of the kings, and uh, we'll see some of the advice that Saul gives the people. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your care for each one of us, but especially for the children in this congregation. And I just pray that you would touch their hearts, help them to see how they can serve you um, with their friends, with their family, with the things that they do in sports or school. Help us to be, as adults, um, a good example. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Grace. Well, good morning, everyone. Just going to rearrange the furniture here. So we are in the middle of a, a sermon series about the values of this church. 
And I want us to think about this particular saying this morning, and it, it goes something like this. The church is only ever one generation away from going extinct. The church is only ever one generation away from going extinct. We say that because as impressive as it is that there are 2.4 billion people, give or take, on this planet that consider themselves Christians, the faith will only continue and it will only exist so long as successive generations of people are being added to it. So if at the end of today, no more people came to faith, no one got baptized, no one uh, joined the church, then by the year 2100, only a tiny fraction of human beings on this planet would be considered part of the church, and within a decade or two of that, there would be no Christians whatsoever, and the church would simply historical artifact. So this raises an, in, uh, an interesting question for us. How do we know that people will continue coming to faith? How do we know that this is something worthwhile for us to do, that this isn't just going to all be for naught? How do we know that people will continually recognize that the gospel is a source of real hope when it seems like so many people want nothing to do with it? So many people consider uh, the church to actually be a, a destructive and harmful force in society. As it stands, Christians only represent about 1% of the population of Whistler. How do we know that that number will not be zero one day? How do we, why, why should we have reason to think that perhaps it could be more than 1%? You know, Jesus said, in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Sorry. That's a promise Jesus makes to his church that we will continue to exist until his return. But how does Jesus make good on that promise? How does he know that we will continue to exist? You know, if he, if he leaves it all up to us, if he leaves it up to Leaders like me, I, I don't know if I would have much reason to have confidence and hope. I am not so confident in my rhetorical skills that I think I can possibly convince you to follow Jesus. I really don't believe that I can possibly convince you that it is better for you to say no to sin when you actually really just love sinning. I can't convince you that there is a better use of there is no better use of your time than to come here on a Sunday morning and hang out with a bunch of hypocrites and be preached to by a hypocrite, especially when we are the most distractible uh, generation that has ever existed in the history of the human race. Human beings today in the Western world have an attention span less than eight-year-olds did 20 years ago. And I'm not so confident that I'm always going to know the right thing to say when someone comes to me for help. I don't know if I would have what it takes to keep someone who's going through the hard things of life from giving into despair and giving up on hope and giving up on God. I don't, I don't think I have that just naturally as, as a skill. The good news is that it's, it's not up to me. It's not up to us to do all those things. For these things, and, and for so much more, we actually depend on a power outside of ourselves. We depend on the power of the Holy Spirit, and so this is why we have a, a core value as a church, which is about the Holy Spirit specifically, and it goes something like this. The Holy Spirit is God in us and among us. He is our helper, our teacher, our comforter in life. We want to grow in hearing him speak to us and through us for him to guide us and to lead us in our walk with Jesus Christ. So it might be strange because this, in, this kind of sounds a little bit like, you know, something that might be in a confession of faith. This is something we believe, but in saying that this is a value, it means that this is something that we trust to have a, a, a function and, and, 
and a major impact on how we go about being the church and how we do church stuff. So this is where we're going this morning. I'm going to talk a bit about how the, the Holy Spirit gives us life, how the Holy Spirit transforms us, how the Spirit advocates for us, and then finally, how the Spirit empowers us. So first, the Spirit gives life. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says something that, that really lays it out for his disciples, really helps them understand what is at stake, what he is asking of them. He says, if any of you will come after me, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross daily and follow me. I want you to let that sink in for a moment. Take up your cross daily. Deny yourself. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, if you want to be a disciple, if you want to be on board with what he is about, it's not going to be easy. The cross, taking up your cross, is not about putting on a piece of jewelry. The cross is a means of execution. It means death. So, if you're going to follow him, there is going to be a cost. You are going to have to give up on your autonomy. Jesus is saying, you have to let go of your own sense of what is good for you, and you have to entrust it to me. And you have to do this. You have to make this decision to give over your trust every day. You know, people in the ancient world who had to take up crosses, these were people who were completely and utterly rejected and despised by their communities. These were people who were marching toward their own deaths. And Jesus is saying, not only do you have to surrender your autonomy, but you have to recognize that you're going to be rejected. People are going to hate you. People are going to be ashamed of you. They're going to be embarrassed that they ever had anything to do with you. And they may kill you. And they will think that they are doing the world a favor, that they are one of the good guys because God's way of doing things and the world's way of doing things are going to be in stark contrast sometimes. What the world calls good, God's going to reveal in his word that that's sin. And what God calls good and calls love, the world will call hate. So Jesus says, stop trying to be in control and doing things the way you think they ought to be done. Stop trying to be liked. You have to even surrender your own sense of self-preservation and follow me. And so Jesus says, you have a choice. Are you going to follow or are, you, or are you not? And that made immediately makes us wonder, why would anyone do this? Why would anyone follow when this is what Jesus asks, right? Why would anyone choose the cross? People like to be in charge of their own lives. People like to be the ones who get to say what is good for them and what isn't. We like to be in control. And when it comes to what is sinful, what isn't, we fundamentally, fundamentally believe that whatever we do, is automatically the right thing to do because if we didn't think that, we wouldn't do it. We love our sins. That's why they're so tempting. Sorry. Like this. And so when it comes to the choice of doing what God says is good and what the world says is good or what we think is good, we have a problem because we are actually utterly incapable of doing God's will. Whatever reasons that there may be for doing what God says is right, we're, we're blind to them. We just don't see it. And Paul describes this blindness in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in our, in our in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live in that way, 
following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. The scripture reveals that we are spiritually dead, and that means we are unable, we are incapable of having a right relationship to our creator. But that's not the end of it, because God takes the initiative. He says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is going to work in you. He's going to breathe new life into you so that it is possible for you to hear and understand and make a choice to follow God. See, the facts don't change, but because of the work of the Holy Spirit, our perception of those facts change. The way we feel about the facts change. Okay, this is a little bit of an embarrassing story for me. But um, when I was seven years old, um, I, I had two sisters, older sisters, who really loved to embarrass their little brother and make him squirm. And so they decided that they were going to take it upon themselves to have the facts of life talk with me when I'm seven. Okay, if, if that phrase, facts of life, is not familiar to you, sex education, okay? They were going to explain to me how this all worked, where babies come from, and their intention was to gross me out, and guess what? They succeeded. I said, I want nothing to do with that. I went and I told my mom and my dad, and I said, if that's how babies are made, I don't think I can ever have kids, because I just don't see myself ever wanting that. So when they finished killing themselves laughing at me, they said they understood, but I might, might change my mind down the road. And sure enough, I began to see the facts in a very different light. And as evidence of that, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I am probably the most prolific dad in Whistler under 40. Anyone know of anyone under 40 in Whistler that has four kids? I have a title, and I'm proud of that. Thank you. <laughs> see, when the Holy Spirit goes to work on us, see, the facts, the, the message of the gospel doesn't change, but we actually begin to see that this is not like a, a hostile thing. This isn't a bad thing for us. This is actually a very beautiful thing. Jesus says in John 16 that he would send the Holy Spirit, and this Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin, and convict it of God's righteousness and of coming judgment. And this word convict, it means to convince it that it's really true. So when we were dead in our sins, we were unresponsive to God because we just saw him as a threat to our autonomy. And anything that was a threat to our autonomy could only ever be bad. Right? Sin was something we wanted because we thought this will give us life. But now, we're actually beginning to see sin for what it is. We're beginning to recognize its toxicity, and we are led to this thing called repentance, to change our minds, to turn away. And we begin to restructure our lives so that instead of going after those sinful desires and pegging all of our hopes and dreams and those things to give us life. We go to the source of life now. We find actual happiness and joy in that. See, the Spirit shows us that we desperately need a Savior, and then when we hear the gospel, the Spirit inside us says, here it is. Here's the peace you are looking for. Here is hope. Here's the love that you have been needing and feeling and longing for every moment of your life. And yes, this Jesus says, take up your cross, follow me, come and die. But you're going to be okay if you do. Because in laying down your life, you gain eternal life. The Spirit says, you have to die to your selfish desires, but you're going to be okay because you gain new desires that instead of sucking the life out of you, actually give you life, give you peace. You know, for us as a church, to say that this is a value, me 
means that it affects how we do things, right? And honestly, the first way that this affects how we do things is that we have to be people of profound humility because guess what? None of us get to take any credit for being here. None of us get to take any credit that we were somehow smarter or more insightful or deeper or whatever in coming to faith because we were all dead in our sins until God breathed life into us. See, being a Christian is not think about thinking that we are better, just that God has done something for us. At the same time, we have to avoid, you know, false humility, and that means, like, you know, that, that tendency people have to say, well, this is just my truth and you do you. No, we say that the, the truth has come after us. God has revealed to us. He's confronted us with the truth about himself. And we can finally see that truth for what it really is. Because we, we just don't hate it anymore. We don't hate the truth. And that allows us to see it. Second thing the Spirit does is the Spirit transform us. See, the work of exposing the ugliness of sin and, and the goodness of grace, it continues all throughout our lives. And as that process happens, we actually become more like Jesus. And in Galatians, Paul tells us that we can recognize that the Holy Spirit is doing things in our lives and changing us because there are going to be some very observable results. And the Bible calls these fruits, right? The same way that a tree produces fruits. So um, there are certain patterns of our lives that will completely cease. And there are new patterns that will begin when the Holy Spirit's working within us. Galatians 5.19 says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living in this sort of life won't inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed their passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You notice how dramatically different these two ways of living are. Notice how different the Spirit makes our interactions with one another. When you're, when you're living your life following the desires of your sinful nature, it leads to you treating people as something other than human, something less worthy than yourself. What does that do when everyone lives that way? Well, it gives us this world of, of pain and disappointment and loneliness and hurt and betrayal and abuse. You know what? This is a world that nobody wants. Nobody wants to live in this, but when everyone does what they want, this is what you get. When everyone follows their own selfish desires, this is the world you get. But the world that the Holy Spirit makes possible is the kind of world that I want to live in. Because when the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you see people not as something less. You see people for who it is that God uh, made them to be. You see what God sees. And you treat people the way that you yourself want to be treated. But this requires a choice, right? You have to actually say yes to the Holy Spirit. The challenge of living a life of peace is that there are times when you don't want peace. You want to avenge your sense of pride. You want to set things right as you see it. So that responds with responding to the hostility of others with hostility yourself. The challenge of patience is that 
When you need it, you don't want it. You don't want to be patient, right? I have this discussion with my kids all the time. The time for patience is when you think you need it least. The challenge of faithfulness is that you have to remain committed even when there is no emotional payoff in the moment and very little hope that things will get better in the near future. The challenge of self-control is that you have to control yourself, but a a self is not a thing that likes to be controlled, right? You want to do what your instincts tell you to do. You ever heard the saying, the heart wants what the heart wants? That's like a mantra that people put up like, in, like on their Facebook walls and stuff. But you know where it came from? It came from Woody Allen and is it describing his incestuous relationship with his stepdaughter. But people live by that. The heart wants what, wants what the heart wants. The challenge of self-control is that you say, actually, what I want is not actually the right thing for me. And the Holy Spirit gives you the freedom to make choices. Holy Spirit gives us, uh, it convinces us that Jesus' way is better and the kingdom that he is building, that he is bringing in, is worth it. It's something that we want. Romans 8 says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So we as a church, we want to be a community that constantly challenges each other to follow the Holy Spirit's leading, to be led and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And guess what? If you embrace these people around you as your family, there will be lots of opportunities to exercise patience, lots of opportunities to show grace, Lots of opportunities for kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. This is as good a place as any to learn to die to yourself. But at the same time, you actually get to experience something you can't really get anywhere else. A place where people show you grace. And they show you patience. And they show you love. And they treat you with gentleness. I don't know where anywhere else where I've experienced anything quite like that. Third thing the Spirit does is the Spirit advocates. So when Jesus describes the Holy Spirit, when he tells his disciples of what the, the Holy Spirit is going to do, he uses a particular Greek word. This word is parakletos. And this is a, a, a word that if you have like three different Bible translations, you might actually get three different words because there isn't a, a single equivalent word in English. Some translations say advocate, some say comforter, some say helper. And all these words kind of describe a part of what the Spirit does. Now, in the most technical sense, this word parakletos is a word that was used in the ancient world for a lawyer that a person or a family would have on permanent retainer. So someone who's always there to step in to help. Someone who's there to defend you when you're being harassed or mistreated. And when you look at the kind of life that Jesus called his disciples to live, you can understand why we would need such a helper in our lives. Jesus said in John 5, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. Life isn't going to be easy for believers. A lot of believers around the world face very real, very intense persecution. In other parts of the world, we face different challenges. Maybe rejection, maybe scorn, maybe op-ed pieces in the local newspaper trying to run you out of town. You know, I think if it were up to our strength alone and our ability to kind of keep our facts in perspective, I don't think anyone would be able to keep themselves from falling into despair. But we do have the Holy Spirit who is our advocate 
who is a witness inside us that says, you are not what they say you are. You are a child of God. You've been adopted into his family. He has made you to be an heir together with Christ of the whole universe. In Romans 8, Paul says, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his children, and now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are God's children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. The Holy Spirit reminds us of who we really are and who our daddy really is. Spirit reminds us that we were made for eternity with him. We live in a culture that doesn't really know what to do with suffering, and so people say things like, oh, it would be so much better for me to just die than live with this pain or this disability or live with this disappointment even, right? The Spirit advocates against those thoughts. The Spirit reminds us that we are so much more than our physical abilities. There's so much more to life than recreational activities. There is more to who we are than the approval of our community. We were made to reign with Christ for eternity. So what is failure? What is disappointment? What is cancer? What is Parkinson's? These are, Paul says, momentary afflictions that are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. What is death itself but a defeated enemy? For when the last trumpet sounds and we are raised to life, we will be given new, incorruptible bodies. And the Holy Spirit reminds us that death will be swallowed up in victory. Death has lost its sting and hell is denied its victory. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness when we, we don't know what to say or how to pray. The Holy Spirit says, it's okay, I'll do the praying for you. And Romans 8 says that he pleads for us in harmony with God's will. The Holy Spirit actually knows what we need. Even when you or I don't know what we need, he knows, and, and, and he knows what God intends to achieve through us. And he brings everything together in perfect harmony. And so as we go through life together, yeah, we're going to have bumps and bruises. And I can't promise you that, you know, here it, as, like, pastors, the leaders, or anyone else will have the right words to say, but the Holy Spirit always does. The Holy Spirit advocates for us, intercedes for us, and he will give us exactly what we need. Fourth and lastly, the Holy Spirit empowers. You know, one of the most striking things that you see when you read the New Testament is that you have this group of Jesus followers in the Gospels who are not particularly bright and they're not particularly brave. And uh, sometimes even when they are brave, it's their lack of brightness that leads them to doing foolish things or saying foolish things. And yet, in the book of Acts, we see all of a sudden the same group of Jesus followers becoming very courageous and actually going out changing the world around them. This, this group of people who were once an, a, a, a terrified little huddle gathered in an upper room are now making the, the rulers and the authorities tremble because they are a movement that cannot be stopped. On the day of Pentecost, um, the Holy Spirit falls upon this group of believers to effect this transformation. They begin speaking in languages, all the languages of all the foreign pilgrims who were in Jerusalem, languages they didn't themselves speak. And people hear the gospel spoken in their own language and they're saved. They get hauled before the religious leaders and they're threatened with jail and torture for speaking about Jesus. But they're not afraid anymore. The authorities are afraid. These uneducated fishermen grossly underqualified for any kind of leadership in a worldly sense, become theologians and leaders and apologists and evangelists. 
for the kingdom of Christ. Jesus promised them that when they needed it, they would have the power from the Holy Spirit to overcome the world. Jesus said in Matthew 10, you will stand before governors and kings because you are my followers, but this will be your opportunity to tell rulers and other unbelievers about me. When you are arrested, don't worry how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Not only does the spirit help us know what to say when we're given these opportunities, but the Holy Spirit also turns each individual person into a functioning member of, of the bigger body of Christ. We become part of this this united group that each uh, member supports one another to, to strengthen the body. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. See, each of us is given an ability, given a, a certain spiritual gift to serve the whole body. And so as a church, for us to value the role of the Holy Spirit means that we want to discover these gifts for serving. We want to put each of you to work. Not because we have stuff to do. I mean, we do. But because in serving, you are becoming who God made you to be. Your uniqueness is intentional. You have something to give. You'll find joy and satisfaction in, in doing what God made you to do. This is how Christ builds his church. The Spirit uses people. He uses the broken, the hurt, the terrified, and the underqualified, and he brings us all together to do amazing things, to build his church that the gates of hell will never prevail against. We want to be the kind of church that recognizes the power available to us, the gifts God has given this group of people, Put those gifts to work. There's a certain line of thinking that rears its head from time to time that goes something like this. If the Holy Spirit moves, if he wills there for the church to grow, it will be done. And we don't need to expend our blood, sweat, and tears and creativity and expose ourselves to risk in order for this to happen. It will just happen. Right? 300 years ago, a man by the name of William Carey, he was preparing to set out to India as a, as a missionary to preach the gospel and translate the Bible there. And he was sharing his plans with a group of pastors before he left. And, and some of them actually started to kind of ridicule him a bit. As he was speaking, one of the elderly ministers shouted over him, young man, sit down. When God decides to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. Now, this is some, how some people think, right? That somehow God's sovereign power negates our responsibility as the church to take action. You know, that's a very convenient way of thinking because it actually lines up with our laziness and our fear. We don't like taking risks. We don't like having to give to things in order to see the gospel go forward, right? Right? As long as we can say, it's not my responsibility, then guess what? We can use our money for our own selfish things. But what really takes more faith? Being complacent and doing nothing or stepping out in the hope and the expectation that the Holy Spirit will use what we offer. That he will overcome our limitations and our failings and accomplish his purposes. See, a high view of God's sovereignty should move us into action. It should compel us to stick our necks out because if he, if he is who he really says he is, he will see it done. Yes, God's power is not limited by our action or inaction, but he has chosen to involve us in his kingdom work. He is pleased to even use the foolishness of preaching to confront the wisdom of the world. 
He's pleased to call his people to be faithful in using the gifts that he has given to get the job done. Jesus wants his church to move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit and expect that he will do great things through us. As William Carey famously said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. For us to live and operate in our values, this is the kind of thing we need to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Father, I, I pray that you'd forgive us for our timidity, forgive us for our inaction, forgive us of, of our fearfulness, forgive us for not coming forth with our, our spiritual gifts to be used by you for your kingdom. Heavenly Father, I, I just pray that we as a church would operate in confidence that the Holy Spirit will give us what we need to do the work that the gospel will go forward here in Whistler. That we won't be 1% forever or even for the next 10 years, but that we will be 2%, then 4%, then 8%, then 16 and, and so forth, Lord, that people who desperately need hope, need forgiveness, need salvation, would find their peace and their rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll invite Pastor David and Scott up. Uh, Scott's going to share his story, and we're going to get ready for the baptism. I'll just make a quick announcement while they're coming up. So this is something that we love to celebrate as a church together, um, and so what that requires is for us to move to a body of water where this can happen. So after the service, um, I'll just, I have a few seats in my vehicle. If you need a ride, I'll meet you outside by the, the, the door. Um, if you also have rides available and for a pedestrian to go to Meadow Park, um, maybe just hang out by where it says Whistler Community Church on the side of the building, and we can make sure that everyone who wants to get there can get there. David. Thank you, Pastor John. Um, April and I drive a kind of beat up, uh, well-worn uh, gold color Ford Escape. Um, so we have room for two if someone needs a ride. This morning, uh, we are welcoming a new member into this church body that we fondly refer to as Whistler Community Church. Since May, I have met on several Sundays after church with a delightful group of people. As a membership and baptism class, we have been seeking to understand what it means to live the Christian life. And together, we also have sought to understand what it means to be his church. A community of God's people that are set apart to be the hands, the feet, and the voice of Jesus. Today, it gives me great joy to tell you that Scott Redenbach has requested to publicly declare his faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord and to belong to his local church. Uh, hello, my name is Scott. Um, and this is my faith journey story. Uh, what was I like before I met Jesus? Well, I was a very hateful, self-centered, angry, and unforgiving person. Uh, how did I meet Jesus? Uh, my parents raised me as a Lutheran in the Lutheran church. I was baptized as an infant, and uh, I was confirmed at 14 years old. Uh, confirmation was more of a rite of passage at the time for me, and not really a true commitment. Uh, toward the end of public high school, the lure of popular culture was too great for me to resist the temptations and false fulfillment that it promotes. About 30 years of self-centered, foolish, and sinful behavior passed by, and I credit my uh, early Christian upbringing 
as the only reason that I avoided uh, complete ruin in my life. Um, unfortunately, he's not here today, but uh, I met Robin Chambers about six years ago in work, and uh, he is uh, amazing, very open and forthcoming with his faith. Uh, so that made a big impression on me at the time. And um, just at the time, I was experiencing just a lot of immense evil in the world, and it was starting to concern me greatly. Um, a few years later, uh, my wife and I had our daughter, Mei Lin, and I, I was just really taken back by the innocence of a uh, child, how overwhelming it was to me, and that sort of awakened my eyes to God again. And then quickly she grew up and began to speak, so her rebellious spirit showed itself uh, quite quickly with the words no. And so at this point I realized uh, how being raised in a Christian family had saved me from many evil paths and that I must provide a godly example for my family. Uh, Mei Lin had really been showing a love of music and my wife wanted to have her do piano lessons. And that's when we met April Gibson. I'm not sure, oh, April's in the back there. Um, I don't know where I would be without you, April, thank you. Uh, and the lessons uh, take place right here, so that was God uh, working in my life. So once I came into the building, um, just all the memories of my childhood being raised in the church came flooding back. And then uh, I just felt a longing to research into Christianity again. And then, of course, I went online and I found a debate site that was arguing about which religion was the best. So that was perfect for my personality. Um, the host of the debate was, he was actually an Orthodox Christian, which I had never heard of before. And he had a lot of compelling arguments and won the debate. So that led me to actually purchase a Orthodox Christian study Bible. And, I read the foreword and kind of put it down. And then uh, coming to piano lessons, uh, we actually met Tin, Bobo, and Taya, and I, I think they're uh, not here at the moment, but uh, they invited us to come to the park and we had a great day and had a lot of things in common. And then one day in passing, uh, I just sort of asked Tin, I had heard that he was quite active in the church. So I asked him, oh, I hear, I hear you're quite active in the church. And he, the look on his face I, was just of alarm. Uh, I guess he maybe thought I was going to ask him why he was crazy or, <laughs> or whatnot. But uh, once I asked him, uh, how old do children start Sunday school? And he, uh, he really lit up and invited us to come to church and told me that at Whistler Community Church, uh, Sunday school uh, begins actually at Malin's age. She was three at the time, so I just really wanted to thank Tin, but I guess he's not here, so I'll talk to him later. And then um, upon arriving at church that first Sunday, I was obviously, like Paul said, sort of nervous and uh, didn't know what to do. And then I just really wanted to thank uh, and Michelle, and then R Ruth is here, um, just for being so outgoing and welcoming. And they just had a lot of encouraging words, so that uh, really made a world of difference of, oh, these people are a lot nicer than general people that you meet. So that kept me wanting to come back to church. And then I, I believe it was at the first service that um, after the service was over, David, uh, approached me really nicely and just to ask my state of faith. So that was um, perfect timing. And I mentioned that I had bought a Orthodox Christian study Bible to try to impress him, I, I guess. And uh, he wasn't very impressed. He, uh, <laughs> a look of concern crossed his face. Um, but uh, if you know David, he's very calm, uh, but 
he had sort of a firm recommendation that I should start with a Christian basic study Bible. So he handed that to me that day. And, and that, that was really a pivotal step in my faith journey to um, actually have a Bible to sink into. So I took the Bible home. I, you know, dove in quickly. I read the foreword. Um, they had basic truths and sort of a Bible overview. And then when I got to the part that had reading plans in the Bible, I was, I was like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll get to the actual reading of the Bible later on. So I put it down. Uh, but what was really important to me was uh, to do some investigation on the Mennonite Brethren and the Whistler Community Church because I hadn't heard of uh, the Mennonite before, so I was uh, very concerned. Um, so who is the Whistler Community Church and what do those who call it their home believe in? Uh, I couldn't find anything negative or any uh, amazing scandals online. I was you know, hoping to find something so that I could have an excuse not to, to come back. But I did find the BC Mennonite Brethren webpage and the uh, Canadian one as well. And it had uh, a lot of really powerful information that actually legitimized the Mennonite Brethren. So I did, didn't have an out there. Then I was like, oh, I'll go to Christianity.com. Maybe there's something else I can learn there that will, you know, give me an out. So I wanted to understand the different Christian denominations uh, because I was raised Lutheran. I didn't really know anything about different denominations. So I found an amazing article comparing uh, uh, different denominations. And then at the end of it, it said... Uh, uh, God gave man the job of being the church, and man typically uh, has to divide, be argumentative, um, so that's why we're here. Um, what does man like to do? We like to argue, challenge, be prideful, and say, um, I'm better than this person, I'm better than that person. So I was just laughing at myself because that described my behavior and thinking perfectly at the time. Um, and then the author finished his statement with, um, the core beliefs are all the same, so just join a local church and get on with the praising of the Lord. So that really impacted me and further gave me no excuses to stop going to church. So uh, I, I found that was a message from God as uh, historically my joy in life was to argue and constantly debate people. Um, so my next stop was the Whistler Community webpage, and I noticed information about Bible studies, and I heard uh, actually Robin Chambers was, uh, he's a leader at one of the Bible studies, so I contacted him just to ask where the Bible studies were and um, when they took place, but he was actually out of town in Australia for a few months, but his wife was uh, taking over in his absence, and I don't think she's here today, but I, I just wanted to say it was such a pleasure to meet Mary Claire. And if uh, you get a chance to talk to her, she's just the perfect person to lead a Bible study. Um, she's just so gentle and kind and humble. And it was just a very positive introduction to group Bible study and the blessings that can be found in the fellowship of a small group because I was, you know, very wary of going to one of these groups. Um, so I just wanted to thank her for her kind words and encouragement. And then I returned the following week and I met, uh, I guess they're not here either, uh, Michelle and Victoria, but uh, they're just uh, so inspirational and they're, they're very kind people, humble and gentle. So um, after that second Bible study, um, I, ju I just thought I was so overwhelmed that if my daughter could be you know, just even half as devout Christian as them, I would, I'd be just such a proud father. Uh, so I just really wanted to thank them for their, you know, setting such a great example and being uh, so kind and understanding. And then I just found that group uh, was a lot younger than myself. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll try the men's Bible study. Might, must be some good things going on there. So uh, then I found out they were reading the Bible in four months. So I was kind of wondering what to do. 
And then I just thought, well, you know, actually reading the Bible might, might be a good idea. So, so against my thinking, I started doing that. And that, that was a real defining moment in my faith journey. Just after reading the entire Bible, the wisdom uh, contained within the pages, uh, being reintroduced to Jesus uh, was, my life was changed forever after, after that. I couldn't deny it anymore. And then I just found the uh, books of Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes were the most uh, profound books in the Old Testament. So I just wanted to read a few short passages. Uh, so Psalm 1, uh, verses 1 to 6. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they, they prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. And I had uh, Proverbs 2, verses 1 to 4. My child, listen to what I say, the treasure, and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. And Ecclesiastes 7, verse 5. Better to be criticized by a wise person than praised by a fool. That was a personal favorite. <laughs> and then Ecclesiastes 12, verses 6 to 7. Uh, yes, remember your creator now while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For the dust will return to the earth, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And then uh, after I finished reading the entire New Testament, I was really ready to commit my life to Jesus, so I just had one uh, following passage that really uh, gave me conviction to do that. Uh, Mark 10, verses 42 to 45. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord over their people, and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So. That was not what I was doing in my life. Um, and then I'd, I'd really like to thank Nico, if, if you wouldn't mind standing up just to give me a break. Uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for setting the goal to have the men's Bible study read the Bible in four months. Um, the decision was instrumental in changing my life, and I just wanted to say we're so blessed to have you in a leadership role in the church. Uh, you're just such a role model, inspiration for our congregation, so thank you. Uh, and then I wanted to thank John. Uh, you also played a really big part in my transformation and interest in joining the church. I just was really moved by your sermon on uh, church membership, and it motivated me to actually go to the membership classes and ultimately proceed with baptism. So th thank you for doing that. Um, and then uh, we move on to how has Jesus impacted my life and what is he still working on in my life right now? Uh, God has upended my life and I mean entirely in a good way. Um, I now wake up every day thinking uh, how can I make the Lord happy, uh, not you know, what do I wanna do today? Um, so I had uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Jesus, or anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Um, this radical change in my thinking has actually compelled me 
to start serving the Lord by donating some of my time each week to uh, several uh, charities in, in Whistler. So I, I started volunteering at the food bank and uh, Whistler Adaptive Sports. So they help people in need and people with physical and uh, mental disabilities. So um, engaging with these charities and the people that they help has uh, been really fulfilling and, and quite humbling. Uh, the Lord has halted my uh, love of debating and my joy of hating on uh, everything and everyone. So that, that's, that's a miracle uh, to anyone who knew me before I started coming to the church. So, um, uh, Of course, I still have many things to work on, uh, but thankfully David has uh, been instrumental in providing me with many gospel-based books from his library and uh, to help with my transformation. So uh, this transformation is ultimately happening by the power of God's word and Jesus' presence in my life. Uh, during my short time back in the church, I've learned that uh, daily study uh, and reading of the scriptures is required to continue to live a Christian life. Uh, it's so easy to revert back to our self-centeredness and uh, the evil ways of the world. Um, and then in ending, uh, why do I want to become a member and wish to be baptized and belong? Um, so that I can be accountable to a wise group of caring Christians uh, for guidance and continue to study daily and attend uh, the weekly small groups. Um, and I wish to be baptized to make a public statement of my faith in Jesus and to lead an example for my family. Um, I see my confession and baptism as a testament to God's saving grace in my life. Uh, and in closing, I'd just like to ask everyone for their help uh, to continue to live a Christian life and uh, in striving to live out uh, right relationships with God and others. So thank you so much for your time. And I thank uh, all of you. And I believe Paul is going to pray for me now. Yeah. Um, Paul, um, Scott has asked Paul on behalf of the congregation to uh, respond to uh, Scott and to affirm him and pray for him. So, Yeah, happy, uh, happy to do this. And, and thanks for asking me to do it. I appreciate it. It's an honor to do it. So, um, yeah, if you just bow your heads in prayer with me. So, dear Heavenly Father, today we lift up Scott in prayer and thank you for softening his heart and making him a new creation. By watching you work in people's lives, we see your glory and thank you for these gifts. You have blessed Scott, his family, and this church, and we are grateful for your love. We come together at this time at Scott's justification. We look forward to walking, him, walking with him through his sanctification, and finally to the day we are all glorified through you. You are our king, our shepherd, our father, our savior, our redeemer, our rock, and in you we find refuge and strength that we cannot find in worldly things. You call us to your throne as your flock, and we will bend in need to you. By accepting the gift you have given us, we are saved. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. Uh, benediction slide. Jaden, can you put the slide up? Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Uh, let's head on over to Meadow Park. Go in peace. <laughs>